Uh, shall we pray? Our Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we come before your presence this morning, O oh God. Thank you, O oh Lord, for your love, your mercies, and uh, the gift of salvation. And we thank you for your grace, Father God. You have accorded us this opportunity to be in your presence with fellow believers. I will pray, Heavenly Father, the Lord, may you accept our service this morning, accept our uh, submission to thee, O oh God. May you prepare our hearts, O oh God, to listen to your word through our present worship and through our the preaching of your word and through the fellowship we'll have this morning. Oh God, we pray for our dear friends who are yet to join us, that Lord, may you remind them of uh, this time of uh, worship, oh God, that they may be able to join us. We pray, Heavenly Father, that Lord, even as we use this man-made uh, internet service, may we not experience any interruption, but may the service run smoothly and may the Holy Spirit guide us through from the beginning to the end. We thank you. We give you the glory in the name of Jesus Christ. We pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's time for praise and worship now. I invite everyone to prepare for that. And uh, please turn off your mics and sing loudly in your uh, space. And uh, Sister Helen and uh, Brother Sam, who is going to lead us uh, in this uh, time of prayer, uh, praise and worship. Thank you, Kent. Good morning, everyone. This morning, let us welcome the presence of God as we continue to declare that He is the heart of worship, the center of everything that we do. Let us sing. When the music fades, all is stripped away. much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart i'm coming back i'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you it's all about you It's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. 
thoughts of menacing coming back to the height of worship and it's all about you it's all about you jesus jesus i'm sorry lord for the thing i faded when it's all about the center of everything that we do in every aspect of our lives. <clears throat> Jesus at the center of it all. center of it all from beginning to the end it will always be it's always been you jesus jesus one more time jesus jesus at the center of it Shall 
confess you Jesus oh Jesus oh Jesus you deserve the praise and glory you be the center of everything in our lives we give you the glory and honor in Jesus name Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sister Elaine, for leading us in, uh, in that moment of praise and worship. Yes, Jesus is the center of our lives. I hope he really is the center of your life, my personal savior. If he's not yet, you are, you, are, you are missing out a lot. Make him your center of your life. Thank you very much. And let's continue praying. And as we continue praying, um, we have some prayer requests. And uh, the, the, the prayers that we pray for as a church, that includes, uh, we, pray, we pray for the globe. We as a believers who are called upon to pray for, for the, uh, the world we live in. So uh, may, I, may I just see the screen for the, um, the prayer request, for the prayer concerns? Thank you, thank you. Sure, okay, so we pray for the world. A lot of things happening in this world. We are aware of the COVID-19. Let's not stop praying about it. Let's continue praying about it. As we pray about it too, let's continue also praying for families that have been affected because of the COVID-19. And also as the vaccine has been um, made available to the world, different types of vaccines, different kind of uh, theories or stories attached to it. But even through it all, may Jesus be the center in all these things that if, if, uh, if it is God's will, may these vaccines be uh, reached to all, every part of the world and uh, may there be no um, disruption whatsoever, but uh, be directed by God's will. Uh, let's continue praying for SNU, uh, Sonash University. The new semester is upon us, spring semester. I know things are, you know, people are adjusting, newcomers are coming in, uh, maybe new professors, new administ uh, 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 people working in different administration offices, <clears throat> departments. Let's continue praying that uh, through SNU uh, uh, for, for all these, uh, the SNU staff and the students alike. And let's continue praying for SNU International Church, uh, our home away from home. Let's continue praying for the, uh, our, our leaders of the church, the pastor, the professors, and uh, the church, uh, the servants, and also just everyone, uh, every, ch every church member. We continue remembering each other in our prayers. We are far away from home. We might not share about our concerns, but in our daily prayers, let's continue also praying for one another. The Bible calls for us to stand in the gap for each other and we should pray without ceasing. So let's continue mm -hmm. praying, uh, about that. And also one more thing, next week we'll be having uh, the newcomers uh, welcoming party. As ISO newcomers welcoming party, it's in conjunction with the church. So let's pray that that be a success too, that the Lord will lead more people, especially newcomers to be part of that uh, a newcomers party. And then I will, so we'll take time to pray just for a uh, few seconds or minutes. And then uh, Sister Ming Zhang is going to lead us into congregational prayer. So um, yeah, shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for the things you do in our lives. Pray for the sake so that you may heal them, O oh God. The Lord will extend your healing hand for the sake. Our sister Minjang to turn on the mic and uh, lead us in prayer. Thank you. Sorry. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this precious gathering so that we can worship you and praise you together. We are the church uh, united as we uh, we are the church uh, united as we pray from different locations through this technology Zoom. 
We know that your spirit is filling us with hope and vision as we go through this difficult time such as this. We come, first of all, with a grateful heart that just we have ex just we have experienced for the last for the last week. Lord. Thank you for this springtime season, uh, which is lifting us with its promise of new life and new season, new life and new uh, new life. Lord. Keep us healthy and help us care for each other as we are waiting for the vaccination. Lord. We trust in you, Lord, because you have been with us, showing us the faithful path in good times and bad. And we want to honor you and we want to praise your name all the days of our lives, Lord. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, um, your presence. Thank you so much for your presence among us so that just we just, uh, uh, we as, as we are prepared to uh, listen to your word. Lord, thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you very much. And uh, now we're going to transition as we prepare to hear the word prepared for us this morning. Uh, Brother Deleje is going to lead us in a scripture reading. Then uh, Pastor David will uh, give the sermon for the day. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Today's verse comes from Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 28. So let's read. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and the female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Amen. Okay, um, I pray and hope that all of you have been reading and meditating and sharing in your uh, eye gathering groups on the first couple of chapters of Book of Genesis. The Bible says before time began, God of the universe created the world with, simply by speaking uh, into the emptiness and the universe as we know and experience and have come to discover was simply created by God simply speaking uh, into this. And then Bible continues on describing the creation account. Not only did he create the, the universe with the stars and galaxies and, and the magnitude of the sun and, and, and different um, uh, galaxies, Milky Ways, etc. Uh, the Bible describes a moment in time when God decided to create human beings uh, in his image. And before that time, he would call everything that he has spoken into existence good. After seeing what he had done, he said it was good. And then comes after he creates human beings in, in his image, the Bible says, uh, it was very good, and he was satisfied with what he has accomplished. And Bible gives a um, sort of momentary transition where he simply decided to rest. It won't be sort of like, it doesn't mean that he stopped engaging in the world or he stopped doing anything that would cause effect uh, in, in this world. He's still sovereign and he's still deeply involved but he rested, uh, stating that what he had created, he was completely satisfied. It would be like you going into the laboratory and working on a project. Day in, day out, you have been working on this for several weeks. And you have gotten a data that completely satisfied you. You wouldn't linger inside the laboratory. 
staring at the uh, data or the result or the apparatus that you've been working with, you would come to a point where you feel that now I could break away from what I had been doing and I could seek rest. Perhaps I will go and fellowship with my friends, uh, go out for dinner or whatever. <clears throat> that type of having uh, a satisfaction, something deeply satisfying uh, is exactly what God had experienced. And that's what he does. He takes a rest. And the segment that we have looked at today is really the account that God uh, decided to create human beings, something very different than what he had created when he put the stars in the sky and he separated the lights from darkness and he separated the waters from the sky, etc. He, he creates the plants of its own kind and animals in its own kind, etc. And we come to the verse that our brother Derrick J. read for us. Then God said, let us make man in our image. In our image, there is a plurality of God describing himself as, a, as using a plural uh, a personal pronoun, saying that let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over fish and the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. You know, this is sort of like the uh, creation mandate. When God created, he wanted to create, he, he actually created human beings to put them over in charge, to have sovereignty over everything else he, that he has created. He had entrusted the sovereign reign, stewardship responsibility for everything. So the Bible says in verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. I know this is kind of confusing. You know, why is this they created him and then they created male and female? So God created them. In verse 28, and God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and every other living creature that moves on the earth. This is sort of like the creation account. Now, the Bible presents the beginning of humanity as being created with the intentional design as both having male and femaleness. The gender, gender differentiation that the Bible describes uh, simply stated that God, from the very beginning, had intentional design of creating humanity in maleness and femaleness. So therefore, this whole idea, the concept of gender, uh, men, women, male, female, is not a, a result of, of cultural or social definition ascribed by a special interest group who claim that they have done extensive research and decided to say, you know, there are multiple genders. And that's not the point of my message. The Bible simply states that there is equal dignity for being male and female because God by design with intentional intentionality, he created human beings in his image male and female. What we can learn from this is we need to understand that God's, there is the God's original intention if we were to carry out this creation mandate. We cannot do it alone. In order for us to multiply and, and subdue the, the world that God has created for us, it requires both male and female. The starting point is to understand why what God created was considered not good in this male and femaleness. Everything God created this far, thus far, uh, the Bible repeats over and over again what God created and saw that it was good. But what when God created Adam, even though the first man, even though Adam knew no sin, had loving and intimate relationship with God in paradise, mind you. 
what God saw and how he described that particular situation, he said it was not good for a man to be alone. This aloneness, aloneness that he saw in Adam is very important for us to understand if we are to understand the marriage in this uh, perspective, because this is critically important. And I, I just want to um, clarify something that my message for today is not intended to explain the variations of the creation account found in both Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Some of you who do investigative reading may, may come up and ask me a question of saying, wait a minute, I thought in Genesis 1, God created the animals before he created human beings, because that comes uh, right before the seventh day. But in Genesis 2, it seems like God created Adam first, and then he brought animals to see if um, uh, Adam could find companions suitable for him. So what's going on? I'm not going to uh, uh, engage in that theological debate or, or discussion. But what I want to uh, really address is really narrow down this whole concept of uh, in creation story that God creates male and female, Adam and Eve, and he instituted the marriage marriage, uh, which represents the Trinitarian communal God, when male and female come together as a family. And this is one of the greatest blessings at the same time of mystery that will not be explained until we get to Ephesians chapter 5. Because when Christ comes and he represents Godhead, and how he relates to the church, the body of believers, it makes um, a sense in, a, in such a way God's original design was intended uh, to create from the very beginning. So today, I just simply want to focus on the biblical view of marriage between man and woman and the purpose of the union. What God saw as not good in Adam was not a mistake God made in creation, but rather his deep affection and love and sovereign grace in the potential of human being created in God's image to bear the Trinitarian Godhead relationship with other human beings. In the marital relationship, if we really understand this, it will come to the closest or the um, closest to understanding the relationship that God the Father has with God the Son and the God the Holy Spirit. So therefore, before I get into the, the marriage, the purpose of marriage in God's created order, I just want to make a few quick observations. Number one is that it is possible that you could have an intimate relationship with God, walking with Him, surrender to Him, worshiping and honoring Him, on a daily basis in every arena of life like Adam did in the Garden of Eden. The Bible says he really walked with God in the Garden of Eden. And yet he overcame with loneliness. He felt isolated, he felt alone. Now, many of you who might be extremely solid, you're committed to Christ, and you, you love God and you love his church. You're doing everything you can, but there is this emptiness, hollowness in your heart. And I just, just want you to know that you could, you could have a perfect relationship with God and yet experience the pain of loneliness or experience solitude in, in, the, um, um, in, and, and be, not completely satisfied. Or another way, you could acquire everything the world could offer you and still feel empty on the inside. You can have all the money, comforts, health, pleasure, satisfaction from academic accomplishments. Even business can be rewarding. And you may have accomplished as an athlete 
and you may have acquired fame and popularity as a celebrity even, but one can still find themselves uh, being extremely lonely. This is not because um, there is something inherently wrong with you. It's just being a human being. God by design created us to become interdependent and live in community in relationship with other human beings. The second thing, second observation is the pain of loneliness. The suffering of isolation and solitude is neither a result of sin that needs to be overcome, nor a sign of spiritual immaturity. Sometimes, you know, uh, we, we say, well, if you're really spiritual, all you need is Christ and everything will be okay. You shouldn't feel lonely because you have God. But I just want you to know that you can have God. You could have a perfect relationship. You could walk with God. You could be reading scripture and you, you will be overwhelmed with spiritual blessing from your reading of scripture and still feel lonely. And it is because we are created as human beings. God by design created us with deep longing and a need for other human beings affection. Now, um, I will talk about this particular affection from your potential spouse, because God has created us with, with this um, a longing that we have inside of our heart, of wanting a companionship that is much greater and deeper than any other um, same-sex friends could provide us with uh, you know friendship that Jonathan had with David they love each other they care deeply for one another but uh, even that uh, was not completely fulfilling nor satisfying loneliness is not a sign of spiritual imperfection either nor as a result of fall because of the sin because in Adam's case, Adam was sinless. He was in paradise. He walked with God. He lived in perfect environment. He knew no sin. And yet, he really didn't even have vocabulary to explain the feelings that he must have been feeling. It really uh, took God to recognize the loneliness that Adam was experiencing. Uh, simply because it was by God's design. Adam really didn't understand what this feeling of isolation or being alone in the middle of um, really a world filled with animals and, and beautiful plants and flowers and perfect conditions. And yet there was a longing in his, inside of his, his heart that he could not identify nor define. And this is because loneliness was embedded simply by being human created in God's image. Okay, that's observation number two. And observation number three is that God, in order to resolve this loneliness problem in human being, it is God who initiates the project for uh, seeking remedy. It's not man trying to overcome this, this loneliness that uh, he strives to overcome or he practices certain set of spiritual discipline in order to overcome. But it is God who initiates and engages first. And God uses the term Azel. Azel which literally means helper, but in scripture, that word is most often uh, connected with in describing the ministry and the role of the Holy Spirit. So therefore, this commonly known word Ezel, or the helper, or helpmate, sometimes got, uh, many people have called over the years, is really a term uh, most synonymously used or equated with the third person of the Trinity who was from very beginning present with God 
and he was involved, intimately involved, when he was creating the world. So Ezel, the helper, is not a weaker being, but a being with power and strength and wisdom. Okay? So, uh, in terms of human relationship, I think we could put uh, people into three possible categories. One is, there is someone who is able to help you, but he or she is simply unwilling to help you. Now that individual, even though uh, that individual has the power, the means, the resources to provide assistance to you, but if that individual is unwilling, that individual is not very helpful to you, right? So that would not describe a Zell situation. But there are people who is unable to help you, but they mean well, they want to help you. They want to serve you. They come and they call you and they will say, let me help you. But you know that that individual does not have the means, nor the ability, nor the wisdom, nor the experience to provide help. help. And sometimes having that kind of individual just coming into your life and occupying your space becomes more of a problem. But the third category of individual is if that someone, Ezel, happens to be someone who is capable, who is able, but at the same time, who is willing to come alongside and help you, you have a winning case. The Holy Spirit uh, is described in that way. He is powerful, he's wise, he's prudent, he's has the means and resources, and he is willing to help us. And that's the, exactly the term that Bible describes when God decided to create women. You know, some people would say, uh, Adam, when, when there was only men in the world, there was no problem, no sin. As soon as the women was created by God, uh, men fell and we sinned. So as if, uh, women were was the cause of the problem however the biblical description or the explanation the storyline is very different so this third person the Holy Spirit uh, uses that term to describe the creation of Eve uh, the person who is able to help you or can help you has to be stronger, wiser, more powerful in order to rescue you. So when God decided to create Eve as an as for Adam, he created Eve more powerful, wiser, stronger, more empathetic to come alongside Adam and more gorgeous and more beautiful than Adam probably was. And the purpose for God creating women for Adam is so that Eve could come alongside to provide coaching, mentoring, and helping Adam to accomplish what God had assigned and assigned Adam to do first. Okay? Now, um, I know that there are some um, uh, theologians and, and um, philosophers that would argue, but that's my position on this reading of this scripture. God, in his infinite wisdom, decided to create women with greater level of sophistication and powerful because uh, babies are not formed inside of a man, but women. You talk about uh, incubating another human life for nine months. You talk about the amount of complicated biological system that women must have. It's just mind-boggling so the Bible is very very clear that God created male and female from the get-go in order to create human beings in God's image what are the implications for an understanding of gender at first at first glance this particular text that we've been reading in the book of Genesis chapter 1 and 2 the text seemed to teach that women are by nature weaker and less capable than men. But now we see that the word does not convey that at all. Indeed, if anything, it conveys that women are stronger than men, at least in many areas. It is not that a woman lacks things a man has, but that she has things that 
men lacked. Therefore, God brought her into the world as as Azel. It is not that woman lacks things that a, a man has, but that she has things that Adam lacked. Here then, we have a vivid confirmation and elaboration of hints in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 and 28, that the sexes are deeply complementary. That when God created human beings in his image, he created a very complex uh, uh, relationship, just as Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit exist in in this community god wanted adam and eve to live in community codependent and interdependent on each other codependence is a wrong word to use interdependence is a better word it's not out of uh neediness that you depend on one another but because you have this dignity of being a human being created in god's image carrying on the imago deo image of god we can provide azel help to another now this country contradicts them both very traditional and very feminist views of understanding gender issues on the one hand he teaches that women are not inferior to men if to be a help is to be inferior then god is inferior to us because the bible says where does our help come from? It is God who is our help. So therefore, this, this is really no, no um, uh, uh, indication that Ezel, women, is weaker vessel. God is uh, much stronger and he's more than capable. Yet on the other hand, he teaches that there must be some ways that the gender are uh, different. We are made male and female we're different and there are some things that women can do better than men and by implication there must be some things men can do better or more effectively than women it's a complex system but a complementary relationship so when god brought eve to adam this is how he responds he says at last and in chapter 2, some of you have may, may have read it already. This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And paraphrasing this, I think Adam woke up from his sleep and saw Eve for the first time. And she is absolutely stunning. She understands me inside out. I am going to call her, woe me. She is someone who desperately part of me. And I could completely relate to her. I think that was kind of the, the nuance that Adam exclaimed. And even the Puritans, uh, quoting from, um, quoted by Matthew Henry's commentary on the whole Bible, um, God decided to make Eve not made out of his head to top him, not out of his feet to be trampled upon by him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected, and near his heart to be beloved. And uh, God says in, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24 and 25, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother, and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Now, uh, for the remaining remainder of time, I want to simply walk through what the Bible says about marriage. And some of you, as, as soon as I mention what is the biblical view on marriage, some of you might object by simply saying, you know, isn't that a partisan view of marriage? Is that a narrow kind of fundamentalist viewpoint on, de on the definition of marriage and family and sexuality? Well, a Christian perspective and a biblical definition of ma marriage may be seen as partisan, but if, you, if the truth were known, every perspective on marriage is partisan. 
if you come from a um, region that embraces this Eastern view of marriage, weddings are viewed as more of a family matter, a communal matter. So therefore, more than the individual rights and pre preferences, parental wishes and, and desires are valued higher. So you hear about, if you watch any of the Korean soap opera, every single story is about uh, two young people falling in love, objected by their parents. And um, sometimes they win and other times the children win. And it, it's really twist and turn of the same story. But if you're coming from the West, individual happiness and fulfillment holds higher value than the family nor the community expectations. Simply put, Romeo and Juliet, you know, and, and love story. Everything is about individual rights, individual perspective on, on how they view love and relationship. So whether you hold Eastern view or Western view, they're partisan. Neither of these tr traditions are based on scientific analysis but really evolve from social, economic, and cultural traditions. In many ways, all perspective on marriage and uh, marriages are religious. Buddhist, um, Buddhist monks will bless someone getting married, but they will never uh, officiate a wedding ceremony. Uh, I don't understand that, but uh, that's what they don't do. They don't officiate wedding ceremonies. Hindu priests will celebrate a wedding ceremony as part of one fulfilling their karma. And Muslims view a marriage as one of the fundamental building blocks of life, an extension of family, giving permission for a man to marry up to four wives because they, they believe uh, that um, procreation is one of the uh, uh, rules that God wants. But the biblical perspective on marriage and family is very, very different. And so what is the essence and purpose of marriage? Or what is really marriage uh, all about? In essence, it's a binding commitment to a long-term covenantal relationship made both privately to each other and in the presence of God in public place. It's a covenantal legal binding, a covenant promise. Um, we live in a consumer oriented society and we view everything from con consumer perspective. You know, I have been a member of Costco. Uh, many of you may know what Costco is for over 20 years. I shop at Costco because the products I want at a regional prices are at Costco. And I have to buy like three months supply of whatever I buy. But however, if I were to find a better product at a re more reasonable prices at e -Mart, there is no covenantal promise that I made with Costco that I could only shop at Costco. I will switch if I get a better deal. I have a membership at Costco, but I'm not bound to it. I don't have a covenantal relationship. But when it comes to my relationship with my daughter, Sarah, is radically different. I am committed to seek what would help her the most. And I would always try to make decisions, even at, at it would mean sacrifice, I would make that decision that would ensure a better future for her rather than look rather than looking for what would benefit me in this relationship most that's a covenantal relationship number two what is the purpose or the mission of the marriage sometimes uh we you you hear things like you know she satisfies me or he is everything i was hoping for in a husband or she completes me. Oh, he is just a, um, uh, someone that I have been looking all my life. And we use many different um, uh, sort of like statements in order to express uh, some kind of satisfaction and fulfillment received by having that relationship. But biblical 
relationship or the uh, purpose of marriage is a mutual discipleship to help your spouse grow as an image bearer of Christ so that God would be glorified in the end. And that would become much more clear later in, in Ephesians chapter 5. Any other purpose will only result in disappointment, disillusionment, or we might be even enslaved to our impulses because we would establish unrealistic expectations on our spouses. We have certain feelings. We would say, you know, my heart palpitates every time I see him or every time I see her, I feel at peace. Feelings and desires, if we were to unveil all the, um, all the coverings at the core, it would be very, very self-serving, self-seeking goals. And we we're trying to look for that in our spouses. Or others, um, we end up living to, to gain approval from our spouses. Because that individual has become so important figure in, in the satisfaction of our life that you will spend an enormous amount of time trying to please, never knowing when you have done enough. And you learn, you yearn, and you, you live to, to um, uh, seek approval from your spouse. And um, over the years, friends, I, ha I have experienced that, you know, some may have a beautiful family, but they're in a very dysfunctional relationship. And they're, they're seeking desperately to gain approval from their spouse. And it's extremely lonely process and, and really um, insecure kind of relationship. But the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, this is another uh, re reading of this week. It says, um, uh, if you were to go back to chapter, chapter 5 and read it from verse 21, include that verse 21. Uh, Apostle Paul says this, submit to one another out of reference for Christ. That's the premise before he goes on to say, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Now in this word, sub submit, over the years, I believe church has misinterpreted this word submission. Submission can be... Um, uh, you know, there are, Apostle Paul makes this statement, who was never married, and uh, Apostle Peter also makes this statement. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, submit to your husbands. But um, I, I have, I'm sure I have um, uh, referred to the, this statement, teaching from the scripture, stating that Apostle Peter, who was married, uh, says in First Peter chapter 3 that submit, wife submit, is in subjunctive mood, meaning that that submission came as a result of some influence that overwhelmed her to choose surrender. But Apostle Paul here says wives submit as, as an imperative. It's a sort of like a command. Okay? But I want you to know that Apostle Peter uh, makes imperative a statement of saying, husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, consistent with Apostle Paul, okay? So for husbands, we have no choice but to love our, our wives as Christ has loved the church. But for wife, I think Peter is more accurate of saying, look, uh, wives need to be loved, and if she feels the affections of her husband, she will choose to submit because love is so overwhelming. Okay? So husbands love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. 
and that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. Because we are members of his body, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, and hold fast to his wife, and two shall become one flesh. And then, and then, Apostle Paul says, this is profound mystery. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So, what is the purpose of marriage? I believe it's a mutual discipleship. You know, sometimes um, people ask, Pastor, if I were to be uh, discipled by a pastor, I think that would be most wonderful, but I beg to differ with you. The best discipler that you could possibly find is your spouse who will live with you 24-7, 365 days a year for, Lord willing, 25, 30, 50 years of your life. What more effective disciples can you find other than your spouse? Your possible relationship with any pastor that you would run across in your entire life, at best, you might have one or two hours with them or her. But with your spouse, your husband, your wife, you will spend life together. And I believe that's the beauty and the mystery of uh, by God's intentional design, bringing someone whom God knew best to help you as an Azel helper, to come alongside, engage your life, penetrate into your life, do life together with you in such a way that you would grow as image bearer of Christ so that one day God will find you useful for his, uh, his kingdom and his, his glory. Now, quickly, for singles, uh, those of you who are yet to be married, you know, how do we find our, our spouse? What, what are some of the criterias? Um, you know, there is no um, uh, specific guidelines in, in Scripture, but I think from the context, we could deduce a couple of things. Number one, um, in your relationship, try to see if you could identify that individual's character. A lot of times, I think we... we um, misprioritize our, our priorities. We look for chemistry, someone that excites us. And when we see someone, uh, we find them attractive, even though that individual may not have the kind of personality nor the character to be your best friend, someone who come along to help you. We, we prioritize chemistry first. The order is reversed. You should look for character first. Number two, we live in a fallen world with all kinds of troubles and challenges that will come our way. So the second thing that you ought to look for is competency. Is this individual responsible? Is he a promise keeper? Is she uh, someone who is faithful? Is, is this individual someone who is, is useful to the society at large? Does the world require that individual's talents and giftedness? And third, I think chemistry is important. I'm not saying neglect that, but just reprioritize your, your priorities in such a way that you would look for someone's character, Christ-like character, faithfulness in worship of God. And practicing disciplines in such a way that individual will continue to develop their competency so that that individual becomes a someone who can make a contribution to the society at large. And third, by God's grace, I believe chemistry will become naturally evolved into something that would become passionate. Okay? Now, um, um, 
my wife will tell you that um, when, she, when she first saw me, she had no interest in me. Um, in fact, her friends found me attractive and so recommended, hey, how about this boy, you know, but uh, my wife, Karen, used to say, you could have him. That was her sentiment. But um, uh, I, I think it took a while for her to come to her senses. And I, I believe it was about six months into like running into each other, bumping into each other, uh, that she completely fell for me. So she's a slow learner, okay? And, um, uh, and I think that chemistry, if, if that could come, it's a blessing. And I, I think God has, has created us in such a way to feel and, and to have all kinds of emotions as a blessing. But keep that priority. But those of you who are married, whatever challenges and, and uh, difficulties you might have, I have a word for you too. Number one, in view of Christ, what God has done for you, try to empathize and understand each other just one more time instead of relying upon your past experiences and and just coming to a drawing a conclusion all too fast just try to empathize and think one more time to understand where he or she is coming from and number two really ask god and pray for god's wisdom to come into your life so that you could collaborate to resolve issues and conflicts you have to become a problem solver together. You know, before we, we get to heaven, we will have trouble. We will constantly have conflicts. And how do we overcome conflicts and, and problems in this world? I think God in his wisdom has given us our spouse, our husband, our wife. And together, we need to become problem solvers in the world. And finally, uh, challenge each other to grow in faith in Christ. Not to usurp their attention for you, but really turn it so that that individual become, would become a faithful worshiper of God. And if we were to focus on those things, God will be pleased and, and more than we could uh, possibly under, fully understand that God who is honored by, by our choices and uh, uh, decisions that we make in order to honor him in every arena of our life will continue to guide and, and lead us moving forward. Okay? All right, let's pray. Um, Father in heaven, we thank you for, uh, for not only creating the world, but creating us in your image and we thank you for creating human beings in your image represented by maleness and femaleness and we know that this is infinite wisdom of God uh, infinite wisdom that you have uh, given to us as a tremendous gift not only that father you have entrusted to us this ability to create life that will last for all of eternity by not only creating us as image bearers, but also giving us the ability to create life that will forever last in your presence. Now, Father, those of us that are married, we know that our marriages are not perfect, but help us to, to uh, imitate and emulate what Christ has done for his church and help us to live in such a way in deference to you, to love and serve each other in such a way that we would be able to come alongside and help our spouses to become a better follower of Jesus Christ, that you ultimately would find our spouse, our husband, and our wife more useful for your kingdom. And Father, we pray for many that are still not married, but longing to be married. Father, we pray that you would bless them and lead them and guide them and allow them to meet someone and encounter someone so that as your spirit leads, Father, be able to, to um, make a covenantal relationship with one another.
to do life together, to journey through many challenges of life together as husband and wives, uh, to, to, to bring glory and honor and validate the wisdom for creating us male and female uh, in your likeness, Father. Father, we live in a very confusing world and gender differences are minimalized. And Father, we hear stories of how laws are by being passed and um, uh, homosexuality and, and same sex and the same gender marriages are even legally allowed and validated and, and even protected by the law. We live in a very confusing world. But Father, we ask that you would help us to understand and, and really apply the biblical truth in such a way that we would honor you first and foremost and live in this world and in, in the nations that you have placed us into as someone who has been, has been dignified by God the Creator so that we will become an indispensable member of that society, that our, our perspective and our, our gentleness in speaking uh, the truth in love will carry uh, uh, increasing weight to influence and help people to find their way back to you and someday encounter you and encounter Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior as well. Father, we pray that you would use SNU International Church with so many different cultures represented and ethnicity represented. Oh, Father, help us to become a community that is constantly seeking your um, perspective on, on uh, the way you view the world. Father, we thank you for this time and we surrender our prayers in Jesus' most precious name. Amen.